Hello, everybody. Hello, good afternoon. Hi, Jesse. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. A pleasant good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my name is Jesse Leon's Information Assistant at the Department of Sustainable Development, and you have just joined this Zoom space for an information session on the ongoing Northeast Coast project, as well as the Southeast Coast project. It's an opportunity really to gain greater insight, understanding on these two initiatives of the Department of Sustainable Development. I'd like to say good afternoon to my colleagues within the department, the staff of the Department of Sustainable Development, special mention to our permanent secretary, Anita Montoot, our Chief Sustainable Development and Environment Officer, Annette Rattigan-Leo. We also have uh, the return, I, I would say, of the Deputy Chief Sustainable Development and Environment Officer, that is Mrs. Dawn Pierre Nathaniel. We hope your leave was enjoyable. Welcome back. Uh, good afternoon also to our unit heads. A special good afternoon to representatives from our partners who have taken the time out to be with us today. Thank you so much. Uh, without further ado, well, just to mention uh, the team over at Protected Areas, Apito's Management Area. And Ms. Bertha Thomas, thank you so much for joining and being part of this. Uh, also to Ms. Donna Edward. And we have from Forestry, I think, Donation Gustav joining us today for this. It was initially um, uh, an internal activity, but we widened it because uh, we thought it important for as many persons who are part and parcel of this, these projects to be in on today's activity. Again, as I indicated, insightful an opportunity to gain a greater understanding of the components that we may not necessarily be a direct part of, but understanding the project as a whole and understanding what the key deliverables are. So moving right along, uh, now that we've gotten the greeting out of the way, uh, we want to go into brief remarks coming from our Chief Sustainable Development and Environment Officer. And she will give you a welcome for today before we get into the meat of today's activity. That is the presentations from Mr. Michael Bob in the person of Mr. Michael Bob, Chief Technical Advisor for the, the Northeast Coast Project, as well as Mr. John Calixt, who he's the National Project Coordinator here at the office for the Department of Sustainable Development, and he is overseeing the Southeast Coast project. Before we get to that, we have welcome remarks from Mrs. Annette Rattigan-Leo, our Chief Sustainable Development and Environment Officer. Mrs. Leo. Hi, thanks very much, Jesse. Colleagues, a very good afternoon to you. I know it is um, Friday afternoon and this is, you know, a time of the week when we tend to pause and reflect and, you know, do our planning for the, the, the coming week. So I definitely want to welcome you and most of all, thank you for joining us on this Friday afternoon. And I hope that this is going to be one of many sessions where we, we seek to share with you just exactly what we hear at the Department of Sustainable Development is doing to transform our lives um, as it relates to our resilience building, the protection of our natural resources, and just general resilience building as it relates to our survival here on this little corner of the planet. As Jess indicated to you, we're gonna be learning more about the underground impacts of two very important projects that um, I, I honestly do not know how it happened, but by, by some stroke of faith, perhaps we have the Northeast meeting the Southeast. And with these two projects being implemented within the Department of Sustainable Development and us being able to build on the synergies of whatever else is happening across our various sister agencies is definitely an opportunity for us to understand what we are doing, to share what we are doing. And, and for me, most important, to bring to you within the department, those of you outside of the department, exactly what the impacts are intended to be. Many times we receive grant funding for projects, they happen, they end, and we do not know what else will come thereafter. And so this afternoon, I invite you to just relax. I know it's after lunch, don't fall asleep. 
you know, and just to hear exactly what our technical advisor and project coordinator have to tell you um, in terms of the projects within the Northeast Coast and the Southeast Coast of St. Lucia. And definitely we're looking, you know, forward to your participation, your contribution. And I'm sure Jesse will give you a heads up in a little bit as to why you ought to be doing this. So without further ado, Jesse, thank you very much. And I extend a very warm welcome to each and everyone. Thanks. And as they say, Jesse, you are muted. Egus. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Mrs. Leo, for both the welcome and, and the reminder. Mrs. Annette Rattigan Leo, Chief Sustainable Development and Environment Officer here at the office. Uh, we want to just let you know that we want this to be, as she indicated, a very uh, a meeting in a very relaxed setting. We hope you don't have uh, any. Um, feel sleepy this afternoon after lunch please try to be on the upbeat it's friday afternoon we know after work you guys are going to have a good time so let's let the good time start from now tgif um at this point i want to let you know that we do have some prizes that we want to give out toward the end of uh, our afternoon activity and one of these prizes is uh, a lunch voucher among other things coming out of the two projects, we have the Ionola Natural Resource Management for the North East Coast Project and the South East Coast Project as well. They do have some paraphernalia that you guys have not yet come upon. So we hope that you pay attention more specifically to the key deliverables coming out of these projects so that you can hopefully win a prize. And so at this time, without further ado, coming to the Chief Technical Advisor, Mr. Michael Bob. He's just an office away from me. We do knock on the walls and do Morse code. That's how we communicate. Um, he is overseeing the Ionola Natural Resource Management of the North East Coast Project. That is the North East Coast Project, as we say. Uh, and he will be presenting for you uh, with that for the next 15 minutes or so. Good afternoon, Mr. Bob. Knock, knock. Yes, good afternoon and um, knock knock. So, but I'm actually not knocking on your office though, but I'm knocking on the hearts and minds of everybody else who's actually with us virtually. So good afternoon to all. And I want to say this is really an informal session. As we heard earlier on, it's Friday. I have 15 minutes. And what I would like to establish very early on is um, I, you could, I could be stopped at any point in time and to keep people awake, to make sure that we are all in keeping with what's actually going on. So without any further ado, as I have been introduced, the name is Michael Bob, and I am the Chief Technical Advisor to the Ionola North East Coast Project. Um, I know I'm talking to a lot of technical people and a lot of people who know about, should know about the Ionola project. This project has been or is funded by Jeff Funds and really organized through UNEP and the actual administrative um, operations of this project is within the Ministry or the Department of Sustainable Development. Also are managed with the forestry department and the fisheries department also. So it, it is a combination and a nice synergy of all various agencies um, put together in managing and trying to get this project going um, for the North East Coast. I um, um, could, Ms. Leos, could you, share or allow us to share the a few slides please done. on um, it's been done okay right can everyone see the presentation which has the i know yes yes Good. perfect okay so this project is really the granddaddy of the East Coast, where it's over four years ago, this project was launched and was in the making. And we've had a series of what is it, technical issues, 
um, administrative problems in terms of, well, setbacks with COVID and other issues where we saw um, the project kind of limping on and has had two extensions. Uh, so at this point in time, we realize we only have one more year, which ends in March of 2022, where the project is concerned. And we have lots of deliverables and outputs that we need to accomplish during this time. Now, clearly, the overall objective of this project, as we would know, is, is really the flagship species is the iguana, the St. Lucia iguana. And the whole thing was to increase management effectiveness and the sustainable use of the Northeast Coast resource base. Now, that project is, there are four pillars on that project. And the first component was to enhance land use planning and to establish a regulatory framework to have this whole area within the whole ecosystem on a sustainable way. The second component was again to enhance the sustainable land management within carbon benefits, also to look at the whole monitoring and the zoning of these areas. The third component really has to do with the whole ecosystems in terms of goods and services so that we can establish this management of the area within the different private landowners. And most importantly, the fourth component is to enhance the whole thing with the biodiversity in terms of not just friendly goods and services, but all about livelihoods. So it's a very, very heavy project, which has this major four components. What has been done, next slide. So what I want to give you here is give you a picture of what the North East Coast region or the North East Coast project looks like. It starts from Esperance to the North, and goes down to Fordor Denry in the south. Then you would see the key here in terms of the various colorations highlighting the significance or highlighting the zoning of the project areas. And it would show the whole thing in terms of the biodiversity, in terms of both marine, which would be within aquatic, and terrestrial. Next time. This one is more dramatic and it gives you more a pictorial view of the island in terms of the northeast right down to the southeast coast. And in that slide, you can literally see the forest reserve in that particular, in both slides, you could, but you can see the demarcation of the forest reserve in that area. One significant landmark within the whole Northeast Coast area is the Granton Estate and the Louvet Estate. Very, very significant. And that is where a lot of the work has to be done or is being done within that project site. One of the things that we have realized that, and what we all know, we're talking about these lands are actually private lands. How can we work with the landowners in making these areas not just productive, but to have it on a sustainable use whereby the landowners and the existing activities that are actually being carried on in these areas can be done in a sustainable way without creating, because that is what we have always been trying to do, to try to develop policy, try to develop a particular framework that would help and benefit not just the owners, but the actual resource. And this has been the challenge for us. 
we do not have a land use policy. We have one, but it's in draft. And that is the issue in terms of private lands, what can be done, what should be done, and how we can make that happen. So within that last year of the project, we are trying to create this voluntary protection agreement with this major land owner, whereby we can create some form of sustainable management where we can embrace the existing farmers in that particular area and also include the community that is neighboring like Debara, the people of Olio, because they play a significant role in terms of what happens in that particular area as it relates to the fauna and flora of that particular region. And you would know that 90% of the farmers in the Grantons or on the Grantons estate are, we don't want to call them squatters, but they're carrying out activity unknown, not unknown, but that the, 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 the estate owner was not being happy with. How do we get them out? This is the conflict. This is where we have been trying to have a lot of um, community development discussions, trying to make them understand that we need to have that buy-in. Do we get them out of the area or do you have government to get them out? So we're working with the landowner together with the technicians in trying to build this type of voluntary agreement where we can use that value of that land, the value of that estate where everyone can benefit. So we have a situation, if it's zoned properly, we have the wildlife where the forestry officers or the forestry department has zoned that area and to look at the significance of wildlife to develop corridors that would not create any way we're going to destroy these species work with the fisheries department in, in terms of zoning the area, the mangroves. We have the turtlebacks coming in for nesting, how all of that can be done in a proper way, in a sustainable way, and not trying to get people out because the most important thing is livelihoods. So that is the aim of that voluntary protection. And so that the landowner can also benefit out of it. So it's going to be a free prone attack where we're going to make sure that in that voluntary protection, that agreement is signed and that we would be able to work with all parties. The thing about the voluntary protection, it, one of the sticking points was the time factor. Do we do it for 30 years? Remembering it's private lands, the landowner has the prerogative to sell. And so we want to make sure that that does not happen. And when it's sold, what we see most times it goes into the development, which is tourism, building big fancy hotels. And as we have dubbed this area to be the last frontier, within the Caribbean, this North East Coast, this resource, cannot be found nowhere else within the region in terms of the species. And I will give you a quick view of the species that we have in that particular area. So we have the Bee Gees. You have the Grantans Beach, great for turtle nesting, our great leatherback one of the few islands even the Caribbean, apart from Trinidad in Matura, that you have these nesting activities taking place on that one mile long of beach. Very significant in terms of the marine life. Next slide. We have the iguana itself. And here you have a picture of the leatherback. We have um, the thrasher that we also have. Next slide. And what I'm giving you now on this, um, if you want to call it satellite image review, is to look at the various ridges, look at the landscape. 
And we heard Ms. Leo talking about the mirroring of the two projects, the Northeast Coast and the Southeast Coast. When we look at it, it's just the East Coast. St. Lucia is 238 square miles, not very big. We need to maintain the sustainability and the biodiversity of this area, not just for us, but for generations to come. So it is very important, especially with the advent or with the whole thing with climate change. Look at the intensity of the hurricanes. Watch how we see so much of erosion of our beaches, how uh, the parts could, could be decimated within one hour of a hurricane. How can we continue and try our best to maintain this balance of development and at the same time conserve and protect the species? Next slide. Right, and these are a few more um, examples, especially the Niger. Then we have the extension of the simplest warbler. And then we're trying to see what we may have that bird still around. No idea where it's completely gone. We have the St. Lucia Oriole. We have the St. The Bullfinch. So it shows clearly the species that we have. And most importantly, our flagship species, the iguana. Now, how we can make this project successful? We need to work with the people. We need to work with the communities. And this is an area where culture is so rich in that area. How do we marry culture together with the people so it can become part and parcel of us? Watch how successful we were with the St. Lucia parrot. It became a household name. The St. Lucia parrot and its conservation efforts went worldwide. Even in Japan, we saw they use this model. Why can't we use the model by using the iguana and knowing that Ayanola, where it came from, how we can now become more patriotic to what we have, how we can talk about the Northeast Coast or the entire West Coast as what is ours. We need to protect it, make it livelihoods in terms of we can get broom handles, we can make, have the Latin year. We can also have honey production, which is a very big thing now, which is part of the project where we have two communities in terms of Babono, um, um, Grantans, or Grantans, Debara, and with Moshi, two groups that we have established and getting project funds in learning how to make honey in terms of protecting special species areas in terms of tree species that we can have honey production. And then we can now identify that honey as ironola honey and other products. We can have medicinal value plants that can be signified as an ironola product. So if we can make this Northeast Coast something that is truly ours, not just the Northeast Coast, but St. Lucia by extension, we, by extension, we need to understand this is what, and that's what we have to do. We also need to look at the art. We need to look at the culture and how we can dramatize, have the young people, like we have the Czech and Pesh and all of them use CDF and all this, like we have carnival. This is an annual thing. So we can make the Northeast Coast and Southeast Coast have a particular day, like we have Juni Creole, and where we can continue to identify with the environment, identify with the changes, identify with the growth of the area. So this was the actual output and the real benefit of this project, not just preservation or protection, but mainly for livelihoods that people can depend on the natural resources for the growth of families, growth of community, growth of St. Lucia. We know for sure development must and will take place, but it must be done in a sustainable way and to make sure that we have the natural resources for many and many generations to come. So I know I only have 15 minutes, but in summary, this is the actual output and the actual benefits of the project that we could try to derive 
within the next six or eight months before the end of March. And what we are hoping to do, if we can achieve these mapping zones, having a few of these areas mapped out, having a few areas worked with the farmers in terms of having the voluntary protection done, there is a great possibility that we could get another extension of the project and to make sure we can have this thing cemented within the different agencies, tourism, planning, agriculture, sustainable development, education, because we think that the educating of our young people with natural resources management into the curricula would have been very important in terms of the buying and so that we can truly understand what sustainable development, what the benefits of our natural resources are all about, only 230 square miles. So with this, I would like to stop and then I would give to my sister project, the Southeast Coast, in terms of um, his presentation. And if there are any questions, we can either take it at the end or you can have them right now. Thank you very much, Mr. Bob, for your presentation. Uh, I now hand over to you, Mr. Calixt, uh, who will be presenting on the Southeast Coast project. So Mr. John Calixt is the National Project Coordinator at the Department of Sustainable Development, uh, overseeing the Integrated Ecosystems Management and Restoration of Forests in the Southeast Coast project. Mr. Calixt. Thank you, Ms. Leos, and good afternoon to everybody. Good afternoon to our Chief Sustainable Development Officer, our PS, um, members of staff of the department, and other invited um, guests who are online with us. Um, we welcome to this presentation this afternoon where both the Northeast and Southeast Coast project um, provide an overview of the project itself. Um, Although we call our project the Southeast Coast Project, the actual project name is the Integrated Ecosystem Management and Restoration of Forests of the Southeast Coast of St. Lucia. So as you can see, it's a, it's a mouthful, it's a handful. So we shorten it to the Southeast Coast Project. Um, on the slide, you can see that um, the funding agency is the Global Environmental Facility and the excluding agency is, the, is UNEP, the United Nations Environment Program with the co-executing agency in the Department of Sustainable Development. We have many co-executing partners. Um, I can name a few very quickly. The Department of um, Agriculture, who is online with us. The um, Department of well, Forestry. Um, we also have the Ministry of Tourism. We have the um, Ministry of Social Equity. We have the Department of Fisheries. We have the Ministry of Commerce and Sedu. Um, we have the National Trust. Um, we have the um, Department of Physical Planning. So we have quite a few, and this is only just a few um, agencies who are all involved in the implementation of this um, project on the Southeast Coast. Um, on the slide, you can see our, our logo, um, which tries to depict the various components and activities and objectives that we are looking for um, and out of the Southeast Coast project. And we're able to also very quickly um, put together a tagline, um, SCCP, People Protective Ecosystems and Sustainable Livelihoods. So um, these are the taglines and the tagline and the logo that we will be um, using show the left of the project. In fact, we have begun using them in our um, paraphernalia, our t-shirts and polo shirts, um, cups and um, umbrellas and as well as our, our face masks. Next slide, uh, just to give a bit of detail on the project. Um, the main objective of the project is to encourage economic development of the Southeast Coast, but at the same time, uh, maintaining healthy ecosystems. We want to encourage sustainable livelihoods and we also want to secure global environmental benefits. Um, just very quickly, the focal point for the focal project um, areas would be biodiversity, land degradation, climate change, and sustainable forest management. In terms of the implementation and arrangements of the project, the agreement was signed on January 1st, 2018. 
The actual start date was January 2019. Um, the end date is December 31st, 2023. Um, our project cost was is 4.2 million US dollars, about 11.9 um, million in fee. The duration is five years, 60 months. And we received our first disbursement in August 2029. And to date, we have spent about um, 290. Well, the first disbursement was about 1.4 um, million US dollars. Um, our first disbursement. Our expenditure to date is no, our, our first was 664,000 US dollars, which is 1.4 million EC. Our expenditure today is about 290,000 um, USD, which is approximately 78,000 um, EC dollars. Our project area, if you go to the right of the screen, um, is from Mandalay Point in Demi. This is just, um, just before um, Bodily. Um, if you travel into Castries and you Go through Denver, you go up past the bridge and go up the hill. There's a lookout area just before the Empire Station. Um, that is um, Mandalay Point, or the fire station before Bodily. That is Mandalay Point. And we go all the way from Mandalay Point all the way to Denver. There are three components to the project. The first one is called ecosystems management. And the major output uh, outputs of the project under this component basically are to one, um, ensure we have a management information system in place and functioning. Two, um, identify, and not just identify, but ensure that we designate two new protected areas, one marine and one terrestrial. Let me just go back to show you the um, areas for the um, protected areas. The blue is, is the area that we, we want to allocate for the um, marine protected area. So any, where along that um, area that you see in blue along the coastline um, can be designated as a protected area. And in the mustard colored area on the land itself is where we're hoping to have one of the um, terrestrial areas. And the thing is to have a corridor linking the two uh, protected areas. One of the, the third major output is to, is to establish a public-private partnership or a sustainable financing mechanism. Um, or if we can have both, then I suppose it's going to be a success for the project. Um, what are our achievements so far under component one? Um, <clears throat> we've been able to launch a number of consultancies, the baseline assessments for the terrestrial and, and um, the um, marine ecosystems. And we are now in the process of finalizing um, arrangements um, to contract a consulting firm for the baseline assessment of the um, terrestrial resources. And um, the second for the marine resources, we are negotiating with one of the consultants um, for that component. These consultancies will, will assist us in identifying the two new protected areas. And based on where we are in terms of the negotiations and the um, arrangements for um, baseline assessment, we are hopeful that we can begin these consultancies in October um, of this year. In terms of the public-private partnerships and the sustainable financing mechanism, we have been um, holding discussions with the St. Lucia Conservation Trust Fund um, to identify what are some of the modalities that we can um, um, establish um, to ensure that our sustainable financing mechanism is you know, up and running in the area. Um, so we have looked at several mechanisms and they're still working to, to determine what is the best mechanism to establish the financing mechanism. I thought it'd be important for us to, be, for us to have an idea of what are some of the, um, the outputs or the targets um, for the project. Um, as Ms. Leo was, was saying earlier in her, in her remarks that the projects come, they implement it, but we're not sure what we, what we need to expect at the end of the project. So for all of us who are involved in, in, in implementing the project, it's important for us to understand what are the, the main targets? What do we expect to achieve at the end of the project? So for component one, we want to ensure that um, for the midterm, which is about a year from now, um, we want to ensure that we, we, we have conducted the baseline assessment of the biological resources in the area. 
um, coming out of that assessment, we want to have a catalog um, which shows you um, some of the high value species and ecosystem and habitats, similar to what Mr. Bob uh, displayed in his, in his um, presentation. So we want to have something similar so that when we are presenting, we can also highlight the species that we have in our area. We want to ensure too that there's a, a GIS map in our forests, so land uses and biological resources. So again, Mr. Bob is able to indicate to you um, where some of those species are found and where they concentrated. So something similar is, is to be done for the Southeast Coast where we can identify where we can find the white vested thrasher or we can find um, um, other fauna and flora in, in, um, in the Southeast Coast where we have culture, cultural heritage and sites, you know, et cetera. Um, under the midterm targets as well, we also need to define um, the protected area boundaries. So in the consultancies, we're going to identify where they are um, so that, you know, at the end of the project, we, we can designate them. And thirdly, negotiations, negotiations are in place for a public-private partnership um, arrangement. At the end of the project, we want to make sure our monitoring system is in place and it's developed, people have access to it. Um, the catalog is finalized. So again, people can, um, the public stakeholders have access to the catalog and um, which can be used for scientific research, um, um, for research by students or students locally. Um, we want to ensure our GIS mapping of you know, the resources again is finalized and, and uploaded in our databases. It's again, so it can be used by um, our public sector workers for decision making or decision makers, everybody else and um, people from overseas. We want to ensure we gazette our protected areas. So we gazette them. We have a management plan for them and that they are established as protected areas, not just demarcate, not just them identified, but they actually function as protected areas. We also want to ensure we have a public private partnership MOU signed. And as I said, all we have a, a system finance mechanism um, established and functional by the end of the project. Component two, restoring degraded areas. And essentially for that component, our outputs are 2,500 hectares of um, forest, reforested areas in the Southeast coast, um, 500 hectares of seagrass beds, coral reefs and mangroves uh, rehabilitated. And we want to control erosion, you know, in areas that, that, that depict significant degradation and cessation. Um, again, what are our accomplishments so far? Two nurseries have been identified, um, one, in, one at the Beaufort Secondary School for a tree um, nursery, so to help us with the rehabilitation of the forest. The second is at Marcotte Mangrove um, to assist with the rehabilitation of um, coral reefs, seagrass beds, and also mangroves. We are currently refurbishing a structure at the school um, to turn it into a nursery building to assist us with the, um, um, the nursery aspects of um, of, of the activity. The ground preparation is about to start, um, where we, which will include drainage and um, irrigation um, you know, for, um, for the tree nursery. Um, in terms of the rehabilitation, we have started, we have actually started that activity in January this year. And we are, the first area that we, we, we started working in is the Guadalajara area in Greece. And um, so far we have rehabilitated approximately 13, 13 acres of crown lands um, that, is, that was degraded. Um, we have also been able to conduct a rapid assessment of the mangroves in Kuala, Miku, and Monku. And Beaufort and um, Miku is to follow um, very shortly. Oh. What are some of the um, media targets that we speak to under component two? A um, thousand hectares of reforested areas as our media target. 200 hectares of mangroves and other coastal vegetation rehabilitated. Um, we want to ensure that um, we are able to identify areas that require a special management regime and a buffer. And uh, these areas, uh, uh, we draft those regimes and we discuss with stakeholders and what those regimes are. Um, we also want to be able to determine what is the, the carbon benefit estimated for the mangrove restoration. And third, finally, we want to ensure that we draft the manuals or guidelines for anti-erosion practices in agricultural landscapes. At the end of the project, 
we want to ensure we have 2,500 hectares reforested or degraded areas throughout the project area, 500 hectares of mangroves and coastal vegetation are rehabilitated. Uh, in terms of the management regi and regimes, um, we want to ensure we have four collaborative agreements with partners which we, we, which we discussed with them but adopted and signed um, as a, a pilot, which can be replicated you know, throughout the island. We want to be able to measure the carbon benefits of the restoration aspects of the um, of, of blue carbon, more or less. And under the anti-erosion land practices, we want to ensure we have 20 small holders or 20 small farmers um, who have been able to reforest the, those, those, their, their, their areas and um, are involved in agro processing activities. Component three, this component is where we uh, involve the residents of the, um, um, the project area and we have them involved in sustainable livelihood activities. And for the output of that activity, we want to start, we want to provide renewable energy technologies to um, producers um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the project area. We want to identify tourism opportunities again for um, community residents. And um, we want to ensure we have 500 hectares of um, the silver forestry practices taking place in the project area. And we want to generate incomes from alternative livelihoods or innovative or creative um, um, livelihood um, activities in the area. And finally, we wanted to ensure that we implemented the com communications um, plan or strategy um, for the Southeast Coast. What are our accomplishments so far? Um, we are negotiating now with the tourism consultants um, in terms of engaging them in, in identifying these um, tourism opportunities. And hopefully we should you know, complete these negotiations um, before the end of, um, or by the middle of um, September. Um, we have also evaluated the proposal for the socioeconomic analysis of the, um, the, well, the project area where we'd be able to identify um, the renewable energy technologies and opportunities and other green economy, blue economy, orange economy activities in the area. We have also begun training farmers and 40 farmers so far have been trained in agroecology and biological pest management um, over the past um, month or so. Um, our public awareness and, and um, communication strategy has been approved um, and they have actually begun implementing the strategy, and um, we are going to be implementing a number of activities, you know, between now and um, um, March next year. What are some of our media targets? We want to ensure that um, we purchase the renewable energy um, equipment for piloting um, in the area. We want to have 2,000 hectares of land in agroforestry, and we want to ensure that we have five sustainable livelihood agroecology projects established um, by, by media, which is, in, as I said, 2022. We also want to ensure that we have, we have drafted the guidelines for responsible tourism developments in the area. So far, in terms of um, the end of the project, we want to ensure that these, the equipment that we have purchased have been installed and are being utilized by those producer organizations. Um, we want to increase our acreage in terms of agroforestry um, um, activities to 5,000 hectares. We want to move from five sustainable livelihood projects to 10 um, sure by the end of the project. And we want to ensure that the guidelines that we've developed are actually being utilized for these um, tourism development activities in the Southeast Coast. What are some of the challenges, challenges that we face in terms of um, implementing the project? Um, first of all, um, there are delays in, 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 I suppose, the review of documents. So in terms of responding to us when we seek you know, information from other co-executing agencies, um, sometimes it takes a while. And yes, we understand that you know, um, officers are, are quite busy. Um, are quite busy in terms of their, um, their, work, their work plan. So, um, they certainly try to help us out, um, but we'd really like to have some, some quicker feedback. Um, there's, there are several delays in the procurement process for suppliers and, and services in terms of suppliers sub submitting their quotes and 
time in terms of the um, um, activities of the, of the Central Tenders Board. Um, we have had several times when um, there were delays in, in when they held the meetings and in response to us as well. And the COVID-19, and that has caused um, several um, issues um, in terms of stakeholder consultations, having meetings, um, trying to get in, in touch with people. Um, people might be isolated in isolations or they might be ill, so um, it's, a, it's a problem. Um, we have challenges meeting our decision makers, you know, to, to engage them and, um, you know, help them to understand what is some of the support that we require from them. And there's also limited capacity of some of our, of our core implementing agencies um, to um, help us, you know, with you know, increasing our implementation. Um, so essentially, um, these are some of the challenges that we have, we have faced um, on the project. I must say that we have been able to um, meet with some many, many other stakeholders in the area, um, agro-processors, um, farmers, CMOS farmers, um, the World Women's Group in Miku, um, some of the beekeepers in the area, um, some of the private sector people and the U4 tourism operators. Um, so notwithstanding, the COVID challenges, we have been able to meet some of these individuals through um, virtually and face-to-face -face, actually. We have had um, some um, focus group meetings um, through the use of Mr. Regis, our um, communication specialist, and also um, some stakeholder meetings where, where we use it to, to identify what was required for our um, communication strategy. Um, so I know that um, my time is very limited, I just want to say that, um, unlike Mr. Bob, who this project is, has, has been on for a while, um, we, we are, we are, we are, it, first it's a journey and we're learning as we go along through that journey, but we can learn from what, uh, what has happened on, at the, um, on the Ayanola project. We're not seeing ourselves as two, we, are, we may be two separate and distinct projects, but it is one we school that, as, as we always say, and we try to collaborate as much as possible um, or share information in terms of the various activities, you know, which you know, two projects. And in fact, we have had a number of tours where both um, members from both of both, both project group project teams have been invited to these tours, and um, I can tell the tours have been very um, informative. So we both will be planning tours together, and we surely like to invite all of you here today um, to really see the beauty of the Southeast Coast. Um, even if it drives through, you don't really see the beauty unless you actually go through and, and take a day um, to go to some of the areas like um, um, Louvet Beach and Granans and um, okay. Low Fair. And we, all, we also have our areas in the Southeast Coast, which we will surely um, um, make discoverable to people um, through the activities of the project. So I'll stop it for now and um, we can take questions from our our co-colleagues who are on the call with us this afternoon. Thank you very much, Ms. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Calix. Um, I also want to thank Mr. Bob for your presentations, both of you for your presentations this afternoon. Um, very crystal clear presentations, and I definitely have a greater understanding, if, if I can speak for everyone else, on what these two projects entail, and uh, not only the accomplishments, but where you are at right now and what you hope to achieve going forward. Uh, at this point, we want to come into, we well, just want to indicate for those of you who came in late, we want to show you that you will have an opportunity to sit through this if, it, if, it's, if you want to. Uh, we will be uploading this uh, recording in its entirety onto YouTube. At this point, we want to come to a question and answer segment. Our time is running out. We want to be as succinct as possible. I did ask for questions in the chat so we could have a smooth Q&A here. Uh, we did get a question uh, for the Northeast Coast Project. Uh, Mr. Bob, the question is, what is the response of the communities to the Ionola project? And if I could just go a step further in terms of the voluntary uh, protection aspect of it, what has the reception been if you have yet engaged the landowners on the idea of getting in on the initiative in this way? Okay, thank um, Very good question. We... There have, has been some engagement with the community 
before my time, there was one meeting at Debara. And, but in terms of the success or the results out of that meeting, because it was held with a few of the farmers that were engaged in farming in the Grantons estate. So we were hoping to have another meeting where we had the technical people, the owners of the estate, and even um, the, 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 the parliamentary representative in that particular area to be there, not, not to tell them about the project, but, but just to speak with them, to, to understand their pain, why they have been in that area. And it's not about trying to get them away from the estate, but try to make them understand the role of the importance of that particular area. Mm -hmm. So that meeting has not taken place yet because of COVID and we cannot have large groups, but we are hoping to maybe do it virtual, just like we're doing the work with the beekeepers. But definitely the communities are key in terms of understanding the way forward and how they play a very important role in the whole sustainable livelihoods and the whole protection of that area. the second part of the question. And also the um, voluntary protection aspect of oh, the landowners. That is going well. We have had discussions with the lawyers of the estate owners. We um, will be reviewing the draft agreement because there it is very heavy. There are some components of that agreement which I think Personally, it's a little too hard in the sense that we want the landowners to be the watchdogs of any fire, wild um, goats and pigs in the area. And we want to make sure that things like sand mining don't take place. There are a few hard cells in that agreement that I don't think we should um, pass on to the landowner. I think we should do it together. There should be a, a, a kind of a unified understanding for the, with the landowner, not say they must do this. And there are some other hard sales there that we want to tell them that they cannot sell the land, but we want to come into an agreement with them and understanding if they're going to sell, we ought to know. Government, the Ministry of um, agriculture, forestry, sustainable development, planning needs to know if that is going to take place. And if it does, that whatever development, it must be done in sync with what we expect within that particular area, within that voluntary protection. So we're reviewing this. It, it, it's too hard. We have to make sure that we are all on, we are on the same playing field. Because as we're saying, the resource belongs to us. This is St. Lucia. And if we so patriotic, we so love our country, we cannot give it away just because of the value for touristic um, value, but it's for St. Lucia and for generations to come. Oh boy, hot button issues right there. Um, I, we have a few uh, words coming from uh, Miss Anita James, and she did have some questions for you. Uh, I just, I was instructed to give her a shout out. So a quick shout out to you, uh, Miss Anita James, a former staff, a uh, great biodiversity resource person. I see her hand is up, so uh, I will depart from what was the intention for a smooth Q&A to engage her. Uh, Miss Anita James? The floor is open to you. Thank you very much, um, Jesse. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Michael and John, very good presentations. I'm really much clearer after listening to you all on the lunchroom a few days ago. Yes, I like all the pictures, which make it more, much more visual, vivid, exactly what it is that you all are up to. Now, John said that the Southeast Coast has actually been designated a protected area and gazetted. We have been working at least 20 odd years on the Northeast Coast. Is that the intention for the Northeast Coast area to also be gazetted and designated a protected area? And of course, after consultation with the community, I think this is the way to go 
for us to be able to get serious about managing that area successfully. What's your take? Jane, just before Mr. Bob respond, um, just a slight correction. I was saying that um, there'll be, we want to establish two protected areas um, along, and I show the boundary. Now, it doesn't mean the entire area will be a protected area. So um, the customers will decide, you know, what part of that area will be a protected area for both the um, marine and the terrestrial. So it's not, it's not the entire coastline or, or um, um, that would be protected, but part of it will be protected. But let me ask, isn't the surface area already, isn't there a surface area, SCPA, the surface? The SEPA, yes. Yeah. surface, right, SEPA, isn't that, right. that already a protected the area? Um, yes, it, well, it is, I think it's a man, what we call a managed area. Um, yeah, so I'm just so, saying maybe hmm. something similar can be done for the Northeast Coast. Oh, okay, well, Mr. Bob? The, the thing to Ms. James, with the Southeast Coast, remember we have the Ramsar sites that are protected already. And these fall within the Marine Reserve. It also falls under the Soil and Water Conservation Act. So yes. there, are, there is this compulsory protective mechanism already. Okay. The Northeast Coast is completely different because the fact is 90% of the land is privately owned. That oh, I see. The All right. mechanics of everything. So that is why we're going through the softer touch because trying to gazette these things, trying to make like as if you're taking the land away from its original owner. We do not have the finances. And one of the things too that I have said, so much money is being spent on conventions, sending right. persons to attend a two week conference that's thousands of dollars all the way in Japan and everywhere else, being funded, right. big funding agencies. Don't tell me that if we negotiate very well, for example, with, with UNESCO, Yes. and other major great funding agencies that we cannot buy or we cannot purchase Grant Answers Estate for even though it's $50 million, the Rockefeller Foundation, there's people with, I mean, Bill Gates is actually going to the moon, going to space for a couple hours. Right, and right. Finding our government officials and our conservationists find ways, mechanisms, that look at the amount of money has been pumped into AIDS Foundation, into right now, into COVID. Can't we get some funding agency to be able to get to purchase or you know, hold in reserve through the whole cons um, um, climate change fund and everything else to hold that estate as a flagship area and still have some form of development? I think it can be done. So this okay. is one of the things I'm trying to push with ICCF in terms of developing a management plan that can be workable and with a sustainable way with all major agencies and fund, fund and, and um, big dollar owners. Okay, thank you, thank you. You're most welcome, Ms. James. And you are my mentor, so I'll always be on your side. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. All right. Thank you very much, Ms. James. They're just giving commendations also in the chat uh, to the uh, two gentlemen giving the presentations for today, indicating that uh, this was a great collaboration. And Mr. Calix, you in particular, making great, great headway. Not that you're not doing so, Mr. Bob, <laughs> but I'm just, I'm, I'm just, um, uh, reading out what I'm seeing in the chat. We also have a question here in terms of the squatters, Mr. Bob. Um, are are they how, how have they been engaged so far? Um, as I said, that's a work in progress, and we have to be uh, very strategic in our approach because the squatters are on private lands, and that has history behind it because the squatters we have there at Grantons. Their father's fathers worked in there. So they feel that they, they have ownership. And it's partly to do with the actual landowners because they have allowed that area, that, that, that situation to go in on for the past 30 and 40 years. So 
how do you get these people out? And so these landowners wanted the forestry department to do that job, to kick them out and to be able to establish something. I don't think that will work. We will have a lot of grief. So my recommendation, the existing farmers that are there, I do not want to call them squatters anymore because they have been there for a long period of time. Get all of them together and to have that discussion to kind of give them something like a temporary, not ownership, but to give them that mandate, to give them that role that you are going to manage that particular area. And do not extend, do not cut any more trees. And whatever they do in terms of to find a proper market for them. So they become part of that management plan for the area. So they are part of it and you won't look at them as being rebels or being to throw them out, but to work with them because they have information. They, they have ways in their, their practices in agriculture, in, in protecting the species. So we incorporate them in that plan. And the his, so that historical become, information. Uh, in historical, right, right you said. So that's, that's what we're hoping to do. Okay, thank you very much for that. The last charge to you, Mr. Bob and Mr. Calix, is to come up with a question for our participants here today, those who have attended our meeting, because we really want to give away at least two prizes before we come to the end. So I'm not sure which of you is going to go first. Uh, southeast, yes. Northeast. Southeast, I'm looking southeast, we'll go first this time around. Um, <clears throat> my question is a very simple question. Can anybody recall what the tagline for the project is? It was shown on our first, um, our first slide this afternoon. So the question is, does anyone remember what is the tagline for the Southeast Coast project? No, we don't have the, the um, Jeopardy instrumental. But I'm going to give about 20 seconds. I see a hand up, Jesse. Hand up. Okay, Jermaine Descartes. Come through. People protecting ecosystems and sustainable livelihoods. Wow. Anybody wow. who's involved in the world will answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> this is in the area. <laughs> Very I didn't know that before. I only learned that today. today. So who's, who's speaking? I'm seeing the name Jermaine Descartes. Jermaine? 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 <laughs> okay, perfect. Congratulations to you. Thank you. Uh, I, I, we will let you know what you have won after the live is done. But uh, let's come to our second question, Mr. Bob. The floor is yours. What is the scientific name for Ayanola, the iguana, the scientific name for the St. Lucia iguana. Wow. <laughs> what is the scientific name for the iguana? 10 seconds. You could just unmute and give your answer. The first one mute and gives the correct answer wins. I suspect a lot of, uh, uh, quite a bit of Googling is happening now. <laughs> <laughs> the scientific name for the iguana. Come on folks, this is going, it's going, and it's very easy. It was on one of Mr. Bob's slide, if I recall. There is something typed in the chat, Jesse. Yeah. Are you answering the question? Levi, are you answering the question? I think that's the type of species. I'm, I'm not too clearly. I might what be wrong though. What did the president? Can you read it out for us? Mr. Bobby has something like Laurenti, L-A-U-R-E-N-T-I. No, no. 
Okay, sorry, Peter. <laughs> Am I going to give for trying? <laughs> it's very simple. Yes, we do have some pencils on offer. <laughs> Come on, guys, you know this. Yvonne? Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, we have... Okay, so we have another question. Simple. Okay. What is the, the patron name for the St. Lucia Niger? The patron name for the St. Lucia Niger. Yeah, or the local name. Mr. Bob, I, I wouldn't want you to be my math teacher. Oh. It's, uh, it was on the screen. So let's give 10 seconds. The Patwa name for the St. Lucia Night Jar. We have somebody just said, is it Pipirit? Nope. <laughs> Is it Papa Poo or Jacques Papa Poo or something like that? Who's saying that? Somebody from Yvonne. Yvonne. That's Yvonne. Can you give that a little more finesse, please? <laughs> you, you, very warm. I'm not sure of the pronunciation. So it, what I say, have is uh -huh. say it Jacques, again, Jacques Papa Poo. Okay, Jack Papa Pao. You're right. I'll give it to you. You, you right. Jack Papa Pao. Right. Okay. So Yvonne won. Congratulations, Yvonne. <laughs> now you could just stop by our office for to collect your prize either today or, or come Monday morning. But we'd like to thank everyone for participating uh, in today's activity. Uh, as we round off, we've gone well over time, so we. We, we have to close up, but I'd like to thank you everyone for being here today. Um, before we go, just want to hear from the communication specialist attached to these two projects, speaking on the significance of uh, internal staff, our partners being in the know where these projects are concerned, especially uh, the t given the timeline of these projects. Uh, is Mr. Regis in the building? Yes. He is. Yes, I'm right next to you. <laughs> hi, hi everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just wanted to again to say how important it is for everyone to really become. Um, there is a amount of tasks to be done to get solutions to really fully appreciate both the North and Southeast Coast. I am very privileged to be working with both those projects, plus the fact that I live in Denry, which is halfway between both of them. Um, so for me, there is so much um, that needs to happen because we live it in the communities. I live right next to where I have iguanas running around by my house. So for us, it is really critical. So I just wanted to, again, thank everyone and ask you to please um, be as supportive as you can when it comes to trying to educate persons. I know uh, we have, we're going to have a lot of conversations happening. I would like for you, especially to keep us on our toes because we sometimes get so comfortable with the language that um, we're speaking above the heads of our people. So it is really critical for persons to um, really have an emotional connection to both the North and the Southeast Coast. So as we do what we do, we would like for you to, um, like I said, keep us on our toes, keep us in the loop as to what do you think is going on on the ground and what do you think, where are we missing our target? because we need you to, to help us to get this out there. Um, those, those two gentlemen are doing some fantastic work, but it translates into nothing if the people that we need to meet do not understand what's going on and do not buy in into the project. And I would like to, again, like I said, thank you for the opportunity to be here um, to do this. And Jesse, fantastic job. I'm looking forward to this becoming a more national um, um, conversation as we move forward. So everyone have a safe weekend and looking forward to seeing what happens next. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Arlene Regis, Communication Specialist for both projects, the Southeast and Northeast Coast projects. Uh, at this time, I want to hand over again to Mrs. Leo, uh, Chief Leo in the Department of Sustainable Development. <laughs> I've been called many things, but never Chief Leo. <laughs> Jesse, wonderful job. Colleagues, thank you. thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. This is one down, and I believe many more to go, because we have have so much more to share and we want to continue to hear from you um, in terms of what we are doing. And Elaine, you, you have emphasized a point that I continue to reiterate at every project steering committee meeting of the Southeast Coast um, project as um, the project manager. We need to be held accountable for what we are doing on behalf of the people of St. Lucia. And therefore, if we slip, you need to tell it to us live and direct there is no time to waste. Our futures are at stake. The future for our younger generation is at stake and therefore we need to be held accountable. Pull us up where we slide. We appreciate that the constructive criticism goes a very long way in making sure that we achieve the targets that we've set ourselves out to do. Colleagues, again, I just want to thank you very much. I enjoyed this session. I don't know about you. My weekend is all on lock and set to go. So again, colleagues, thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to inviting you to other such sessions in the very near future, I hope, Jesse. And we just want to keep the ball rolling, keeping you involved as we go along in implementing our mandates. And I must close by saying our continued thanks to our fellow agencies who continue to support us. Yes, sometimes the feedback is slow, we know the pressure is there all around, but we thank you nonetheless. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, have yourself a very safe weekend and be blessed. Thanks, Jesse. Thank you very much, Chief. And if you could just let me know, let us know if you enjoyed, if you took something away from uh, today's presentations, just type in yes in the chat. It's sort of an exit survey, I would say, if you enjoyed today's engagement. And on that note, I would like to thank everyone who participated today. Uh, most of all, our two presenters, our Chief Sustainable Development and Environmental Officer, our Communication Specialist for the two projects. So uh, Mr. Bob, Mr. Calix, Mr. Regis, Mrs. Leo, thank you so much for being a part of this and providing some elucidation clarity on these two projects. And we, we usually see components, the components of the machine chugging along in terms of these projects happening, but never the overarching. So definitely much appreciated. And I look forward to really breaking this down so that uh, persons out there, if you could have a news release, something go out so that persons can gain greater understanding of it. And I'm so happy that Mrs. Leo has said that we can make this something regular. Uh, it, it would definitely benefit me just coming into the department in understanding uh, more and more of the department's activities and ongoing initiatives. Again, I'd like to thank you so much for being part of this virtual information session of the Department of Sustainable Development. My name is Jesse Leons. Do enjoy your weekend, TGIF. Ciao. Oh. Everybody. <laughs> uh, okay, Chief Leo. Bye. Come on, Mr. Bob. <laughs>